description. Lord, you're too marvelous for words. You're too wonderful for comprehension. You're like nothing I've ever seen. Father, we do stand in awe of you tonight. We thank you, Father God, that you are our healer. You are our deliverer. Father, we thank you that you are our comforter. You are our helper. Father, we thank you that you are the one that we can run to. We thank you, Father, you are the one in which we trust. Father, we thank you that all of our faith and confidence is in you and in you alone. And Father, we thank you that in spite of ourselves, in spite of the people that we are, that you love us anyway. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Father, that you love us and that you have a plan and a purpose and a destiny for each and every one of us. And Father, we just worship you tonight. We worship you tonight. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. You are a good God. You are our God. And we worship you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Why don't y'all shake hands with one another before you're seated tonight? Tell you God is good. Amen.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good to see all you guys. Um, good report about Miss Brenda Powell, right? Good report. Uh, Miss Tanya was just sharing with me that she's doing well, that she's talking and she's recovering, and um, things are happening a little bit more quickly than what the doctors are saying. And um, Tanya said that she and Stephanie were there and just praising the Lord with Miss Brenda in the hospital, and she was able to lift her hands a little bit and praise God. And so we just thank God for a speedy, supernatural recovery for her. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, another thing that I need to just mention is next Wednesday night is Hallelujah Night, and so our kids are going to just be having a grand old time. Um, the kids are going to start earlier next Wednesday. They're going to start at 630 the teens are also going to be starting at that time because the teens are going to be down there helping uh, minister to the kids. And um, so that's all going to happen at 630. Now we're going to start in the sanctuary next Wednesday at normal time. So we'll start in here at 7. But if you ride the bus, then just get on the bus whenever the bus driver tells you they're coming by. Okay. <laughs> so I'm assuming that if adults and kids are riding the same bus from the same location, then you'll just have to ride the bus a little earlier next week. But that's okay because you can come on in. You can fellowship with whoever's here. You can stand and worship God. You can, you know, just, you know, be here. So, um, so that's fine. But we will have normal service time next next Wednesday night from seven to eight fifteen, just like always. All right. So, I had to we had to find that out real quick right before service. Um, also, if you have not um, had an opportunity to bring any candy for the kids, um, then we still have Sunday, and so go ahead and do that. There's some containers out there in the hallway. Make sure you bring some individually wrapped things so those um, teachers down there can can portion those out to the kids. We just want to bring them in and. Get them full of Jesus and sugar and send them on home to their mamas. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's uh, it'll, they'll have a good time. They always have a real good time. Um, you know, one of the things, this is just a side note, but, you know, in, in the process of us slowly getting unpacked and moved in to our new home, um, we've been there for a couple months now, time's flying by, but, um, but I'm going through things, you know, because we didn't have time with my daddy being sick and me being in the hospital with him all the way up until a couple of days before we moved. I didn't have time to weed out before we moved, which is what, I, ideally, you weed out, throw away so you don't have to pack and move all that stuff, you know what I mean? Well, we didn't have time to do that, so everything just kind of got thrown in boxes and moved over there. So as I'm unpacking, now I'm doing all that weeding out and throwing things away and looking at stuff. But right now, um, this last weekend, I had about three boxes worth of things from my kids from when they were little, you know, all that stuff that they make at school and all that stuff they make at church. And it was really such a blessing to me to pull out a lot of those things that my kids, they're 22 and 20 now. They grew up here in this house. When we came here, they were two and four. Right, yeah, two and four. And they, they grew up in this house. And so I'm digging through that. And I'm finding all kinds of things. And I found this one thing that Andrew wrote. I don't know how little he was. He's never really little. But I don't know how young he was <laughs> when he wrote it. But um, it was one of those fill-in-the-blank things. And it says, when I grow up, I want to be. And he said, when I grow up, I want to be Pastor David. And it was P-A-S-T-E-R, Pastor, Pastor David. Because I want to be a pastor just like him, is what he said. <laughs> and I just thought, that was so sweet. And, um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of things, you know, a lot of things in there about, you know, just where they, you know, were learning things about the Bible. And they were learning the books of the Bible. And they were learning, you know, important truths that, you know, no matter where they are right now in their walk with God, those things are in them. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes, especially when you're the mother of an adult child or, a, you know, transitioning into an adulthood child, I keep telling my kids, you know, I'm not going to really call you an adult till you're 25, so don't, you know. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's encouraging to me to know that even though they're not, you know, necessarily walking as closely with the Lord as I want them to right now, I know all those seeds are there. And those, it's, it's in them. And they can't unhear what they've heard, and they can't, you know, they can't unknow the things that they know, right? And so, you know, the Word of God is, it's alive, and it's powerful, and it's on the inside of them, and it's just, it's been a real blessing to me. It's been an encouragement to me. It's just like I needed to find some of those things from their little selves, you know, those, the, the, their, their childlike selves, just to, to encourage me now to say, yeah, I know, they're going to they're gonna make it, amen? <laughs> so, and I said that, I don't know why, just because I did, and um, so, but, you know, we're talking about, um, here on Wednesday night, we're talking about the apostolic, we're talking about an apostolic church, and, you know, that's all part of it. You know, we started off talking about the kids, and I'm talking about my kids, and, you know, an apostolic church is, is all about raising up generations of believers, and it's not about, you know, unfortunately, being a teacher in the school system, I find out things that 
that happen in other churches in the community and in the area um, and get passed off as church on Wednesday night, you know. Um, you know, kids that the reason why they go to such and such as church is because they get every Wednesday night, they get pizza and they get to play basketball. And I ask them, well, what do you learn about the word? Well, we don't, they don't read the Bible. They don't, they don't have a Bible lesson. They don't have even any kind of a devotional. I'm thinking of a couple different churches that I've been told about for years now, same churches, lots of different kids. So it must, must be the, the pattern. And, um, you know, but they go to play and they go to hang out and, you know, and I guess there's an advantage of, you know, taking them to church to play and hang out. If they're going to play and hang out, they might as well play and hang out at church. But, you know, church is not for that. You know, church is for developing and discipling and training and bringing up your children in the way that they should go so that when they're old, they won't, older, they won't depart from that. And, you know, so I'm so thankful that we have been planted in this church now for um, almost 17 years. I'm so thankful that my kids were raised in this church because I know that they got a lot more than basketball on Wednesday night. I know that they got a lot more than pizza on Wednesday night. I know that they got a lot more than, I mean, this is fantastic that we do this for the kids and they have a lot of fun, but I, I promise you that they also are taught Bible scriptures and lessons and things. It's not just Hallelujah Night with candy and games and stuff. I mean, there's a, a point and a purpose behind a lot of that, and the kids get so much more here. And, um, and so, and that's, you know, one of the things that you'll find is another, you know, we've been talking about what is, what is an apostolic church, what's different about an apostolic church from a, a different church, a traditional kind of church. Well, this is one of the things. You're going to find kids that know the Bible. You're going to find kids that know the Word of God. And you're going to find, you know, people who are passionate about making sure that children know and believe in and trust in God and the God of the Bible that we're talking about, not just some secular God, right? And, um, you know, and, and so I just, that's one of the things that I'm just really grateful for. You know, oftentimes, every once in a while, Apostle just, you know, he just will turn to me and said, stand up and tell the people what you've gotten out of being here at Gateway. <laughs> you know, just put me on the spot. Well, that's, that's one of those things that I can always go to. I am so, so thankful that this church is a church of the Word. Not doctrine, not tradition, but the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And so in saying that then, you know, we're going to spend, we're spending a lot of time in the Word the more that Apostle has, you know, released me to go on with this particular teaching, the more that I feel like I don't have to apologize for the fact that we're digging into scriptures. And this is a teaching time on Wednesday night, so we're, we're going to continue on doing some teaching. So what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and open up to the um, kind of the foundational scripture that we've been reading um, for this teaching the past few weeks. And that's Ephesians chapter 4. Years ago... In 2001, February the 6th, 2001, if you, that, that date is ingrained in my mind because Apostle talks about it so often. But on that day, he woke up from in a, in a dream, and in that dream, he had been preaching in a denominational church here in this community someplace. And um, He never does call the church, but he was, he was preaching in that particular church. It was like a, more of a mainstream kind of denominational church. And he was up in the pulpit of that church, and he was preaching. And as he, as he looked down to look at his Bible, he realized that there was like a shadow. You know, right now, if I put my hand right here because of the lighting, there's a shadow on my Bible. Well, I know that's my hand. So he looked down, and he noticed there was a shadow. So he thought something was up above his head, and he reached up, and he realized that he was wearing a ball cap. And so in his dream, you know, he was really embarrassed because he's standing in the pulpit of a traditional church. Now, it really might not make that big a difference to y'all. If he walked up in here on a Sunday and had a ball cap on, it probably would make a bit of difference to you guys. But in that particular setting, it wasn't appropriate, and he was embarrassed. And so, you know, he quickly kind of tried to take that cap off, and he looked back down to go back to his text, and he saw that there was a shadow again. And he reached back up, and there was another hat. And he did that several times. And when he woke up and he was disturbed kind of in his spirit by the dream and, and, you know, the Lord started revealing to him what that was all about. And the Lord said to him, the pattern, this is like earth shattering, groundbreaking revelation. The pattern for the New Testament church is in the New Testament. Okay. And I remember the first time I heard him say that. In, in the pulpit. The first time I heard him say that, and I thought, well, you know, that just makes sense, right? I mean, you know, because at the time, if you think back, this is 10 years ago, or, you know, 12 years ago, at that period of time in the body of Christ, there were all kinds of books that were being released about how to build a church, you know, 
uh, church building conferences, church growth conferences, how to build a church, how to model a church, the, the purpose-driven church, the this, that, and the other church, all kinds of books that were out there that were talking about how to build a church, but not all of those books were, ta were taking you back to the actual New Testament where God built the church. And so, you know, so when the Lord said to Apostle that the pattern for the New Testament church is in the New Testament, then what he realized was that in that dream that all of those hats that he was taking off were just layers of religious thinking because it was all on his head. Layers and layers and layers of religious thinking where he had been taught and trained in many different ways un under many different denominations as he was brought up many different thought patterns about what church was supposed to be. And, you know, really, here we are 12 years later, 12, the number of government, and here we are 12 years later, okay? And 12 years later, as we're talking still about the apostolic church, y'all, we still have hats. We still have hats that we're taking off. We still have layers of religious thinking and indoctrination that we are peeling off slowly, one cap at a time, year after year, you know, month after month, you know, season after season, anytime, you know, and, and anytime that we go through any kind of a major attack as a body, which we have been over the past few months, you know, the enemies really come after this body in so many ways over the past several months. Well, what that does is it helps to reveal to us what other cap we still have on. What other, what other layer of religious thinking do we still have on? What's different still about the way we think and the way we do compared to what's in the Word? Amen? So it just gives us more opportunity to examine our thoughts, to examine where we are, and to kind of realign ourselves, you know, more, much more closely, to more closely align ourselves with the Word of God. Because, you know, people can come up with all kinds of schemes and all kinds of strategies. They can come up with all kinds of programs, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with any of them, okay? Not saying that there's necessarily anything wrong with them. But, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking that if, if I, you know, if I want to live in a designer house, right, if I want... If I want to live in just an exceptional, high-quality house, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the actual person who, in, who came up with the concept for that house to build that house. I'm not going to go to the mobile home building house place and ask them to make a knockoff of the house that I, that I see. You understand? And, that's, and there's nothing wrong with either of those things. It's just that if we're talking about the house of God, if we're talking about the Word of God, then let's go to God because he's the one who's the architect, right? He's the one who's the designer. He's the one who has, who has you know, created the church for his purpose. And unfortunately, the church is being used right now for a lot of political purposes. The church is being used for all kinds of purposes other than the purpose of God. And it's up to us as people of the Bible you know, because we also, I mean, just because we're an apostolic church, we have an apostle at our helm. We believe in the fivefold ministry. We believe in the, the equipping of the saints, the, equip, the equipping and the enabling and the mobilization of the saints. We believe that we, every one of us, as a member in the body, that we're destined to fulfill a specific purpose in the body of Christ and that we're sent here for such a time as this to impact and bring about change, transformation of the kingdom of God to the community to which we're sent. So we have to, we're here to be a blessing to the people we live around and the people we live with. We're not here to sit around and pat ourselves on the back and talk about how wonderful and holy and good we are and show each other our gold watches and our shiny cars, right? So we're here for a reason and we know this, okay? But we're also not, you know, we're, we're not saying that, oh, well, because we're, we're, we're not going to put a label on us either. You know what, I, I mean, we are an apostolic church because we have an apostle, we're apostolic people. But, you know, you also have to watch that because there are people out there who claim to be apostles who aren't. They got their apostleship from, you know, a cereal box or something. I don't know where they got it from. I mean, you know, you can write away for stuff online. You can, you know, you can follow somebody online who claims to be an apostle and he can send you, you send him a thousand dollars and he'll make you one too. Well, I don't want, I don't want any kind of gift like that, right? Because that's not from God. So, you know, really what we are is we're a New Testament church. We're a New Testament Bible believing, Jesus following, Holy Ghost filled church. Amen. 
And so because of that, then, you know, we need to make sure that we are following along closely with the Word of God, following along closely, and not, not get distracted. Right now, there's, it seems like there's so many distractions right now. And, you know, part of it, I blame, I blame a lot of that on, on the accessibility of information. You know, I mean, we are the information age, right? And, I mean, there's information everywhere. I mean, you guys all got all kinds of information in your pockets right now. You got it in your pocket. You got it in your pocketbook. You got it, you know, any, you know, you, you can access the Internet, the World Wide Web, and just a snap. Information, right? There's about nothing that you can't find out. People don't even need to know anything anymore as long as they got a phone because they can look it up. I don't need to know something. I've got it right here. I can just Google it, you know. And, um, you know, so, so anyway, so there's, there's, all, there's all kinds of, you know, stuff that's out there, information that's out there. And unfortunately, part, that's, part of that is causing some issues, you know. Um, things, you know, one preacher can get on TV and he can say something. And another preacher can get on TV and say something about him saying something. And it's not just about those two men saying something or even about them saying something about each other. It's the 5,100,073 viewers who have seen this, liked this video on YouTube, commented on this video, and everybody's opinion going all and on and on. I started looking up something this afternoon, and I'm like, oh, no, I just can't, I can't go there. I can't, get, I can't get involved in that because everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a reason, and everybody has a reason for having their opinion, and everybody can voice their opinion. And before you know it, everybody's riled up about somebody else's opinion. Well, who gives a rip about your opinion? I, don't, I mean, you have one. You got one of some other things, too, but I don't really care about that either. I mean, you know, my daddy used to, my daddy used to say stuff like that to me. If you get it, then you've heard that, too. We're not going to go showing that around neither, are we, Kathy? No. Okay. So, but the thing is, I mean, you know, I was thinking when I was, you know, getting ready to come over here tonight, it's like we've had the age of reason. You know, you teach about, you know, different ages of mankind. We've had the age of reason, and now we got the age of, these are my first ten reasons. You know, these are my ten reasons why I think this about you, or I want to say this about you. Well, who cares? What I want to know is I want to know what the Word says. I want to know what the Word says. And, you know, really what somebody else is doing is really none of my business. And, you know, the media, you know, somebody can say something. You can even say that you're on live TV, but that doesn't mean it. That doesn't mean it's really live because you can clip, edit, cut, paste. And before you know it, somebody's saying that, you know, Bozo the Clown is, you know, the Antichrist. I mean, you never, people can say all kinds of stuff. And it looks like they're saying it live and in person, but that doesn't mean that they said any of that. That just means that somebody clipped all that stuff together. You know what I'm saying? But, and so there's a lot of, and it, so it's distraction. And it causes a lot of division, and it causes a lot of schisms, and it causes, you know, people to rise up and say, see, those Christians are, are idiots, and Christians are rising up and saying, wait a minute, you know, I, I think this, and I think this, and it, but people are getting away from the Word, and they're focusing on all this peripheral stuff, and it, it does make the church look pretty chaotic and pretty idiotic and pretty ununified, and so that's not what we're all about, you know, that's not what we're all about. What we're all about is we're going to focus on this word, and we're going to see what does God say. And if we've heard it before, then we're going to hear it again. And if we've heard it before and we realize when we hear it again, hey, I'm, my life is not lining up with this. I need to hear this again and again and again and again and again and again. If we need to hear it again and again for 12 more years, okay. It's just the way it is. I mean, it's you know, been working pretty good for about 2,000 years now, so I think that it'll work well for however long, however much longer, you know. All right, y'all all right? You've endured my soapbox for the evening, so uh, hallelujah. All right, and I wasn't even in Ephesians. I was sitting here looking at Acts for some reason, so because I was talking about the church. <laughs> so let me get on over here for just a second. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 4, and I want us to, um, to you know, last week we were, um, if we looked at verse 12, for the past couple of weeks, in verse 12 of Ephesians 4, it says, for the equipping of the saints. Just we, we stopped on that word equipping. We've been talking about the word equipping for a little while. And that word equipping actually has a threefold meaning. We've talked about the first two meanings last week. If you weren't here, you can listen to it. Um, but the, the meaning in it, that word equipping means to mend, it means to prepare, and it means to enable. 
all right? To mend, to prepare, and to enable. So we talked about that a lot last week. We talked about the mending, and we talked about the preparing, and I told you that tonight we're going to talk about the enabling part, all right? So everybody's good? All right. So the word enable, then, you know, if that word, all of those meanings there, the nuances of that word means to, um, to mend, to prepare, and to enable. The, the word enable means to make able. Okay, it seems pretty simple, but I want you just to think about that for just a second. To make able for the work of the ministry, because that's what that verse says, for the equipping of the saints. Who all is a saint? Everybody in here is a saint. Everybody in here is born again. You love Jesus. You've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Okay? You're a saint. You're not one of those people who has a little halo glowing around your head all the time. That doesn't mean that you're a saint. All right? Um, you know, Catholics believe that in order to be a saint that you have to have witnessed or participated in some kind of a, a supernatural miracle in order for you to be a saint. And I would say that every one of us, that when you're born again, you have participated in the original supernatural miracle. Amen? Because once what, what was dead is now alive, that's a miracle. Amen? So, you know, so all of us don't feel so special about your halo, right? Because all of us then have that. <laughs> Okay, we all are saints. So the equipping of the saints, and you know, I just realized this is going off to Honduras in a Catholic nation, and so look it up in the Bible. <laughs> I don't have time to stop there, but I just realized that I just said that. We don't really have a lot of Catholic people around here, but, um, but we're going out there in the Internet, and, and there are Catholic people out there. So look that up for me. All right, so we are saints. If we're born again, then we are the saints of God. So we are saints, and we have been equipped. In other words, we have been mended first because we were broken. We have been prepared, and we have been enabled for the work of the ministry. Well, a lot of times, you know, what happens when you, when you think about that verse on kind of just this basic level, you think about the work of the ministry, then don't have, be honest here. Automatically, your mind goes, when you hear that phrase, the work of the ministry, automatically your mind goes to more what, like what I'm doing right now doesn't it? Okay, be honest. What Apostle does, what Orlando does, what Pastor Bill, Pastor T does, you know, people who have more of a five-fold ministry, we look at that as the ministry. And so we just back up. I know that before I had a revelation of the gift of God on the inside of me and my calling and my purpose, and that I would look at that and I would think that that was for somebody else, the work of the ministry. Okay? But what this is saying is that as saints, and we all just agreed, everybody here is born again. If not, we pray for you right now. Just sick, Pastor T, Pastor Bill on you, you get saved just like that. All right, but everybody in here is born again. So that means that you are all enabled or you have been made able for the work of the ministry. Well, what ministry? Because then when people start to, the other ditch, okay, one ditch is, only the people in the pulpit have the ministry. The other ditch is, oh, well, then we've all been enabled for the work of the ministry, so I must be called to the pulpit, right? I mean, that's the other ditch. E either it's only those people or everybody's called to the pulpit. No, those are both ditches, okay? We want to make sure we're walking the straight and narrow or walking down the middle of this road here. We're not going to walk on the ditch, all right? So, but what that means is that we have been made able. It also means, enabled means to give power. It means to be given the means. It means to be given the competence or the ability to do something. So, in order for you to do the work of the ministry, you've been given the power to do the work of the ministry. You have been given the means, anything that you need in order to do that work of the ministry. You have been given the competence. Any of y'all ever felt incompetent? I mean it. You just feel like, I have no idea what's happening. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. This is so much bigger than me. And in the past, as for me anyway, in the past, if something was bigger than me, if there was something that I did not know how to do instinctively, or if I couldn't figure it out pretty quick, I would back away from it. Because I had this thing. It's called pride. And this thing was like, if I can't do it perfectly, if I can't, if I don't know that I'm competent and everybody else would go, dang, how does she do that? Okay? If that can't happen, then I'm not going to try it. And so if it looked like I wasn't, if, it, if I was approaching something and I wasn't sure I was going to be competent in it, I would not even attempt it. 
And in that way, everything I did, I was awesome at. You know what I'm saying? I was awesome at everything I did. But there's a whole sea of things that I would not do because I was afraid that I would not be awesome at it. All right? Well, where God was concerned, a lot of what he's needed me to do was over here in this place that I would not do because I was afraid I wouldn't, I wouldn't be good at it or I knew I wouldn't be good at it. I right out knew I would not be good at it. For example, dealing with people, T. I know that I seem like really cuddly and stuff like now, <laughs> but I haven't always been that way, okay? I was thinking about that today when I was in my classroom with my kids because, you know, now, I mean, I still call them kids. They hate it when I call them kids because they're teenagers. But, um, but, you know, I'm in my classroom and I'm working with teens. And, you know, teenagers are not always the easiest creatures on the planet to talk to. <laughs> and try having 20 to 30 of them in a room with you at the same time all day long. Other people's teenagers, not your own that you can drag off by the ear and give them a whoop in some place. But, I mean, someone else's teenagers, right? So, you know, I have kids ask me idiotic things. I have kids do ridiculous, asinine things and think that they're going to get away with it, okay? But the funny thing is this, all right? So in the past, the me that stopped teaching, I stopped teaching high school. I'm just going to take a little side journey here. Y'all are all right. I graduated from the University of Georgia in 1987 with a degree in English education, okay? My first job was at Clark Central High School summer school, teaching ninth grade English to people who should have been seniors like a year before and could not pass ninth grade English, but they were football players and they were really good. And so I had to get up in there and I had to teach them English to get them to pass that class so they could graduate and they could go on to play football at the University of Georgia. Okay, that's like the long and short of it. But also in that class were some other heathens. Okay, I mean, not just, not just, the, not just the dumb jock guys, but, you know, people who just, they got in trouble in school, they got pregnant in school, they dealt drugs in school, they got kicked out, so here they are in summer school. So, I'm at the doorway, I have a kid in the hallway reciting Shakespeare to me, okay, reciting Shakespeare to me for a grade, I'm standing there taking a grade, I got this jock in the corner over here who I had already taken away this tennis ball from because he was bouncing it around in the classroom. I had his tennis ball in my hand and he would not shut up. And I'm, this kid here is, is reciting Shakespeare to me and I took that tennis ball and I beamed it across the room. And I swear, <laughs> Melissa, you're about right where he was. And I hit him right in the forehead with that tennis ball. <laughs> and he jumped up out of his desk and he went, he said a bad word. I know that surprises you. But he said, <laughs> I'm just going to say what he said. Y'all will be all right. He said, damn, Miss Crawford, that was a good throw. <laughs> and this is where I realized I wasn't, I wasn't going to be fit for the classroom right yet. Because I said, you're damn right it was. Now sit down. <laughs> That's what I said. This is my first teaching job. I'm just barely 21 years old. I have a bad temper. I'm not born again. Y'all don't judge, okay? And I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, I just spent four years, on, you know, however many thousands of my daddy's dollars to go to this school. I graduated from the school. I have the diploma. I don't know if I can do this without killing somebody. I didn't get a job that fall, right? I'm bartending instead. Still heathen, okay? I'm bartending, waiting tables instead, working at night, so I decide that I'm going to try to keep my feet in the educational system during the day. So during the day, I'm substitute teaching in Clark County. I get sent to Clark Middle School. I am in a seventh grade class. I teach whatever it was. I don't even know what class it was. I get through whatever the teacher's lesson plan was for the day. The bell rings, dismiss the class. I go to bend over to do something with the papers right there, and this kid walks by and he grabs my butt. I'm 21, I'm not saved, okay? I t I'm this way. I take this kid's hand like this, and I bend it backwards like this, and I push him up against the wall with his elbow up under his throat. And I, before I realized what I was doing, I had no, I mean, it was just the instinct. It was like that. And once I realized, I'm looking at his face, because he's like, <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> That's what I thought. 
And so I let go of him, and I said, get out of this class. And behind me was this other kid going, dude, don't you ever touch my teacher like that. She was nice. Don't ever do that. You know, whatever. And I'm like, okay. I didn't take another substitute job, and I decided teaching was not for me. Why? Because it's over here in this realm of I can't do it. I'm not competent. I'm not equipped. I don't have the patience. I don't, I don't have the ability to control my temper. I cannot put up with other people's crap. I can't do it. And so I didn't do it. For a number of years, I didn't do it. And just the other day, I had, you know, I had this older, I had a, a student that I had last year. She's the older sibling of a student I have this year. The student I have this year, he had to have detention for me. And she said to him, because she came and told me, she said this, I don't know how you have detention for Miss Frederick. She is the nicest teacher I have ever had. And I, I looked at her and I thought, you are really, I'm so sorry. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and I was thinking that still, because I still have that mindset about myself sometimes. But today, I'm standing there and have this kid who's just being a jerk and who's being stupid and saying stuff. And I just, was, I just was looking at that person, and I was smiling, and I was talking in a really calm voice, and I just kind of calmed them right down, and I redirected them, and then they were happy, and I was happy, and I didn't cuss at anybody, and I didn't <laughs> slam anybody up against the wall, and I didn't even picture myself doing it. I mean, you know, so that's like, so what, what all that means is that there has come a place as I've walked into the assignment that I've had, that is not my ability. That's not my nature. You understand? That's the nature of God on the inside of me. That's a big difference. And see, if I hadn't told you all the real bad stuff, don't go out there telling everybody. Because that, 25 years ago, okay, that's a long time. So 25 years ago, another county ago. Okay, look, I was teacher of the year for this county two years ago. <laughs> But how did that happen? Because of God, see? Because I looked at what, what I was called to do. I didn't even know that I was called to do it. I looked at what I was called to do, and I said, I'm not competent for that. I'm not equipped for that. I can't do it. And as a matter of fact, when we moved here to this county, I, that's what I was still saying. I can't do it. I cannot teach. I'll do anything but teach. I don't want to teach. I don't want to mess with other people's kids. I don't want to do that. I can't do it. I can't control my temper. I can't control my mouth. I can't control, you know, what other people's kids do. It makes me angry. It makes me upset. I can't do it, you know. And, but by the grace of God, amen, amen, by the grace of God and with his ability and with Holy Ghost as my teacher, yes. teachers need teachers, with Holy Ghost as my teacher then, I've been able to grow into different places to where now, after all this time, not only am I back at the high school level, but it's kind of like, I don't know. I mean, I, I love being where I am, but it just feels like redemption to me. You know what I'm saying? It feels like I've walked through a lot of things, a lot of seasons of, of dying to myself <laughs> and growing and changing so that I can stand in a place and be able to talk to these young men and women and just and to, and to, when I'm there and I'm in their presence and I know that I'm empowered by Holy Ghost to be there and that God has positioned me there, I know that the presence of God is there with me to impact their lives. And so what does it do? Well, it causes them to say things, you know, nice about me that ordinarily my natural self people wouldn't say. But you know what? It's not a lie. And it's not a facade. It's, that's just who I am now, which is different than who I was. Thank God. And thank God you are different than who you are. Amen. And um, so, you know, so all of that, I mean, this is we're still just talking about the definition of being enabled. But that word equipping for the work of the ministry, it means that you are made competent you have been given the ability to do whatever the work of the ministry is for you. For you, okay? I don't know what you need. You might be the opposite. You might have been somebody who was very meek and very mild and very laid back and very kind of timid. And don't make that face, Kathy. Those people exist, okay? <laughs> You know, I mean, you might be somebody who's just real chill, you know, just super relaxed. But in order for you to step into the place that God has for you, you might have to come on over to the dark side a little, you know. I mean, you might have to, you might have to, you know, you might have to get to that place to where you are more forceful and more, you know, co confrontational and more, you might have to be that way for whatever your ministry is. You might not 
but you might have to be. And if you have to be, the great thing about that is that whatever you have to be, you can be because if, of God, because of the Holy Ghost. So you are, you are competent to do whatever it is God has called you to do, but not because of you, but because of God. You know, so often I look at Apostle David and I think, you know, this is remarkable because as much of an intellectual snob as I always was my whole life, and here I've been for 17 years sitting under a man who's a high school dropout from Franklin County, Georgia, country, rural, all of the things that he is. But the most, and don't, I don't want him to hear this, Eric. <laughs> But, you know, sometimes, I mean, he just says some of the, the most brilliant, insightful things come right out of his mouth. And I just look at him and I think, boy, that is God. That is just God. Because the man was not competent in those areas. You know, sometimes he'll be talking and he'll, or he'll be, he'll be preaching about something. He'll be, you know, going away and he'll be talking about a certain something. And just the right word that is, you know, that would fit in the, in the sentence that he's saying, that word will come to my mind. And it's a word that I know that probably in the natural, he doesn't know. But he'll just say it. And I'll be like, wow. You know, and sometimes, I mean, I have, you know, little, little things, little notes in my, in my notebook. I have these, you know, little places where we have cokerisms. You know, every time he says something funny or crazy or whatever, then we, you know, we write it all down. We keep a record of it. I don't know what we're going to do with it, but we're keeping up with them. And so I'll write those little things down. And then sometimes, you know, I'll give him, like, vocabulary points because, I mean, he's just like, <laughs> I'm just like, wow, that was a good word. You know, I just write that down. Why? But see, it's the grace of God, and I recognize that. You recognize that. If you know him or you know where he's from or you know people like him, then you understand that he, he cannot function and he cannot do the things that he's doing except for the fact that God has made him competent. See? The foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And that's what God's all about. And so you don't have to worry about whether or not you're competent or whether or not you know how to do something or whether or not you think you can do something. If God has called you to, then he's made you competent. So it's a matter of you growing in your faith in that area to walk in the competence that he's already given you. Another thing that that word enabled means is that it means that you are authorized. And we've talked quite a bit over the past few months about our authority as believers and what we're authorized to do. It means to make you ready or to equip you. Okay, so what, that connects back to the other part of that definition, that preparation. All of these words are, you know, they're connected with one another. So, you know, we need to understand that because of that equipping that we have been authorized and we have been made competent to do the work of the ministry. We have been enabled to do the work of the ministry. But here's the big question everybody wants to know. Well, what is the work of the ministry? What's the work of the ministry for me? What's, you know, you were just talking about the work of the ministry for you. I mean, you've got, you know, you're in the pulpit doing this in your church, you're a teacher, whatever, but what about me? What's the work of the ministry for me? So since you're asking those things, back up to um, verse 1 in Ephesians 4. Y'all still all right? All right, you look at verse 1 for a second. I'm going to put this mic down and get a drink of water. All right, so verse 1 in this same chapter says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, I'm reading in the New King James. If you have the King James, it'll say the vocation there. How many of y'all got that? Vocation, all right. So does anybody have a different word besides calling or vocation? All right. So you... He, Paul is beseeching us, he was beseeching those at the church at Ephesus, and he's beseeching us even today through this word, to walk worthy of the calling of the vocation with which you were called. Well, now let's just stop on that for a second. Because, again, you know, that word, if you don't really think about the, the subtle nuances of that word, it can trip you up. Because you might think, well, that just means your job. Or it means, you know, your job in the ministry. Or it might just mean something really vague, like you're calling. People always say, oh, I just believe I'm called to do something for God. I'm like, duh. If you're born again, yes, you are. Everybody is, so you're not special, okay? Everybody is called to do something for God, every single person, and this is why. Because that word calling there means the call of your salvation, of your salvation. 
So if you're saved, then you're called with the calling of your own salvation. How about that? So it's not, really a, it's not really a wonder. Oh, well, I'm just waiting to get my call from God. Okay, knucklehead, are you born again? If you're born again, then that call is already deposited in your spirit because the very second that your spirit man is regenerated and your old man is dead and your new man enters into your body and your spirit man is made new just like that, just in the blinking of an eye and you've accepted Christ and now you're born again, with that born-again spirit, with that new nature, comes the call. It's there. It's already there. You're not waiting for a second something to happen. If you're born again, the call is already there. Okay? It's there. It's on the inside of you in seed form. It's, it belongs to you. It's right there. And, but what is that about? Because, see, we think so much, we focus on salvation as being, I've been saved from hell. I've been saved from sin. I've been saved from death. I've been saved from the grips of the enemy, the grips of the devil. Well, yeah, all of that is true. You have been ransomed. You've been saved from those things. But your salvation isn't just about you being, you know, snatched out of the, de the depths of hell or snatched out of the grip of the devil. Your salvation is because you're not just saved from something, but you're saved to something. So what are you saved to? What are you saved for? What is that salvation for? That calling, that salvation that you have received when you receive Christ comes with a calling for you. It's your vocation. It's your job in the spirit world. It's the thing that God has prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You know, if you go and you read all of those scriptures, Old Testament scriptures that, you know, from the foundation of the world, I knew you. I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. I called you. I equipped you. How is all that possible? Well, it's because God knows his spirit, right? And if we have the spirit of God on the inside of us, we have his spirit is in us. Amen. Then... That Christ that's in us, that Christ in us has a vocation, has something to create. Because God is a creator. God is the creator. He speaks and things create. Things happen, right? That is the very essence of God. You know, he, 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 because he is the creator, everything that is exists, all right? Well, that same that same ability is part of our spiritual makeup. It's part of our spiritual DNA. And so that vocation in the spirit is inside. It's just connected to our spirit. And so when we're born again, here comes the vocation. All right? And so every sing because of that, then every single person who is born again has a specific vocation in the spirit. You have a specific call. Right? Think about... Think about you, you know, it used to be, again, going back to other denominations like the Catholic Church and so forth. People would, you know, think that you could do things to get somebody else saved. You could do penance. You could say prayers. You could offer money. You could, you know, you could do things so that a loved one could be saved. Well, that's not scripture, okay? You have to call on the name of the Lord so that you are saved. Every person is responsible for accepting Christ on their own. Amen? And so, so with that, you know, because you can't, you can't get somebody else saved, you can't do anything to cause, you know, to make somebody else be saved. Now, yes, you can pray for them, okay? And those prayers take effect. And yes, I thank God. Don't we all thank God for the prayers of intercessors and those who have prayed? Yes. But what I'm talking about is that you can't buy somebody else's salvation. You can't earn somebody else's salvation. There's nothing that you can do in your own works to make somebody else get saved. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So in the same way, you know, you cannot earn a calling that's different than the one that you have. Okay? You don't get somebody else's calling. I can't have Brother Ricky's calling. Okay? I can't have Miss Barbara's calling. Why? Because that's hers. That's his. It you know, whatever your calling is, is part of your salvation. Because I had nothing to do with your salvation. That was all Jesus. Okay? Because I had nothing to do with your salvation. I also have nothing to do with your calling. 
See, you can't, people run around after ministers wanting, to, wanting them to lay hands on them so that they'll be called into the ministry. They can't call you into the ministry. They can't, they can't set you apart for the ministry. Only God can do that. You start messing around with that, that's witchcraft. That's what that is. That's witchcraft. So, I mean, I could prophesy over any one of you anything you wanted me to prophesy for a certain amount of money. Right? Anybody could. That's witchcraft. It's demonic. It's not God. Your calling, your vocation in the spirit came from God with your born-again spirit. Do we all see that? Okay, because that's what the scripture says, because we're talking about your, your vocation. And that word vocation there, that, that word calling, talks, means the calling of salvation. Now, how, so how do you walk that out then? Because he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. In other words, I beg you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Not the calling with which somebody else was called, but the calling with which you were called. Well, how do you walk that out? How do you walk worthy of your salvation? How do you do that? The first thing you got to know is that you didn't earn it, <laughs> right? I mean, you did nothing to earn it. All you did was throw yourself at the mercy of God and say, Father, forgive me of my sins, and I accept your son in replacement for my sin as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins, taking my place. You know, you trust in him as your Lord and Savior. So how do you walk that out then? And he doesn't stop, okay? He doesn't stop and just say, well, just figure it out on your own. This is what he says in verse 2. He says, with all lowliness, okay? This is how you walk out your call, your vocation. First of all, number one, lowliness, Lowliness. Lowliness means having a humble opinion of yourself. Okay? It doesn't mean that you put yourself down. I hate people who put themselves down because really all they're doing is they want me to say, oh, no, you're really great. And I want to just say, yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, they say, you know, they say, oh, I'm just, you know, stupid. And I want to just look at them and say, yes, you are. And I want to say that because if you're stupid enough to say you're stupid, then you're stupid. Right? Come on, y'all. So, <laughs> but, so I'm not talking about false, what is that? That's just false humility. That's just pride in, not necessarily in reverse. It's just, peop, it's just somebody saying something about themselves in a bad way because they want to manipulate you and control you into saying something good about them. Well, I don't play that game. So, and you know. It, it takes a skill to not play that game and still be that nice teacher that somebody is talking about. You know, I mean, that takes a Holy Ghost skill. But lowliness means having a humble opinion of yourself. And, y'all, all that simply means is just knowing that without him, you can do nothing. Without him, apart from him, I can do nothing. It's, it's that whole mindset, that whole attitude of dying daily to yourself, of knowing that it, it's more of him and less of me. Like John said, more of him, less of me, you know. And when you understand that you by yourself cannot do it, me by myself, I cannot be a good wife, I cannot be a good mama, I cannot be a good teacher, I can't be a good friend, I can't certainly can't be a good preacher, minister. There's nothing that I can do by myself that's any good. And I know because I've tried to do all of those things by myself. I've tried to do all of those things apart from him. And I've fallen flat on my face every time. And so will you, if you will be honest. You know, any time that we try to, you know, step out on our own without God, then, you know, we fall on our face. So lowliness just simply means understanding that with, you need God. You need him. You're desperate for him. You have to have him. Without him working and moving and being in your life, you're nothing. You're absolutely nothing. And that applies, you know, if you are already nothing, then that's not really that hard. It's not too much of a stretch. But when people start telling you good stuff about yourself, when people start telling you what kind of an impact you're making in their lives, when people start, you know, talking to you about how, you know, that they really appreciate you and stuff, well, then there's a little bit of... You know, I mean, there's a tendency for you to start getting puffed up, but that's where you got to remember, no, honey, it's not you. It's not you. It's him. So how do you, how do you walk out that calling? Number one, loneliness. Number two, meekness. 
with all lowliness and the, the New King James says gentleness. The King James says meekness. Meekness is not the same thing as being like a timid little mousy person. That's not the same thing. Meekness just simply means a gentleness of spirit. And it was when I hit this part of my notes today that made me, that triggered that thought that I was sharing with you earlier about me being able to stand there in a very gentle and calm way, which is not my human nature, but that is my godly nature. To be able to stand there in a gentle and a calm way and to redirect some moron, okay? I mean, that is God. That is not me. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I'm just calling it like it is, T. Don't, don't fall off the chair. Okay, but meekness, that gentleness of spirit, okay? And look, y'all, that just goes along with compassion. I mean, you know, people, people are ridiculous and, and, and awful and do all kinds of crazy things, but you got to take a step back for just a second and think, why are they doing that? You know, why are they like that? It's like that woman I told you about that I work with, that, that teacher that is just, I mean, she is like the most miserable person in the world. And I feel very, I, I don't want to say I feel sorry for her because it's not necessarily a pity, but I feel a compassion for her because there has, there's a void in her life somewhere that's not filled up with the joy of the Lord. It's not filled up with the peace of God. It's not filled up with those things that belong to her because I know she is saved. And so, you know, but that meekness, that gentleness of spirit is what can rise to the top then to help equip you, to help enable you to minister, to do, to be, to stand in whatever position that you have to stand in, right? As long as you're not trying to be the bull in the china shop and run everybody over and run everybody down, if you realize that there is a place in the spirit of power that's meekness, because that's what Paul says to do, walk this way. This is the way you walk out your vocation, your calling. First of all, in all lowliness. Second of all, in meekness. And third of all, with long-suffering, which is what none of you want to hear tonight. Okay? Because long-suffering just means patience, endurance, perseverance with people. With people. So you can put up with circumstances sometimes. You can put up with stuff. You can put up with weather. You can put up with the dog, the cat. You can put up with all kinds of things. But when it comes to that certain person that grates on your every last nerve, what is that? They're pressing, 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 pressing in on that place in your life where you need to develop that long suffering. It's, it's there, but you have to grow in that. Because if it's bothering you, if it's pushing on you, if it feels like that stubbed toe that just won't quit hurting, then it's because you need to grow in that area. Because Paul says that in order for you to walk worthy of the salvation that you were freely given, that you have to do it in lowliness, meekness, and with long suffering. If you're going to walk worthy of the gift that you've been given, this is the way you do it. And if you're going to walk worthy of the gift that you've been given then it's going to take some sacrifice on your part. It's going to take some growing and some stretching and some changing on your part. And for some of us, it takes more than others. And for all of us, it takes something. But long-suffering means patience, endurance. It means constancy, steadfastness, perseverance. It means being slow in avenging wrongs. You know, I walk away from situations sometimes and I think, man, I should have said this and I should have said that and I wish I had done this and I wish I had said that. And I'll go all through that stuff in my head and get it kind of out of my system and then I'll think, nah, I did the right thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't say anything. I thank God because I, you know, if it had been up to me, I would have done all of those things, but I didn't. I'm so glad. Thank you, Holy Ghost, you know. But being that long suffering, that's another way that you walk another, another way that you walk worthy of that calling. Another thing here, he says, he says, bearing with one another. You know, I mean, God, I would be fine if it just, if you just would leave other people out of this, I would just be fine. You know, I mean, if I could just, if you could have put in there that for me to walk worthy, then there's stuff I could do, like, you know, pray. If you said, oh, pray a certain number of hours or read a certain number of books or, you know, do these things. If you could do these actions, you know, in order to walk worthy of your calling, that'd be so much easier for me. But instead, he had to put in all this stuff about other people 
about how to be and act and live and and move around other people. Forbearing others means to lift them up. To lift them up. You know, so often it's, it's our nature that if someone comes in and says, man, I'm just having the worst day and, you know, this happened and this happened and this happened, then all we're doing is we're just waiting for them to get to the end of their list and take a breath so we can jump in and go, oh, yeah, well, in my life, this is what's happening, this is what's happening, this is what's happening. And that's, you know, that's, the, that's our human nature is to try to just try to outdo somebody else's sorrow and misery. You know, you think you got it bad. You don't have it bad. I have it bad. You want to talk about bad? I got it real bad. I mean, that's, that's kind of our nature for those kind of things. Instead of thinking, how can I, in spite of what I'm going through, how can I lift up this brother or sister? In spite, of, in spite of what's pressing in on me, can I do something for somebody else? When you forbear with one another, that means that you lift them up. You don't tear them down. You don't, you don't work against them. Instead, you do what you can to lift them up. Well, that's the opposite of human nature. That's why it's called the God nature. That's the God nature in us. It's not the man nature in us. It's not the sin nature in us. It's God's nature in us. See? Forbearing is to lift another up. And then here's this last in verse 3. It says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Well, he has just told us a whole lifetime worth of a lesson in three verses. Five things. Imagine that. Endeavoring means to be diligent. It means to make haste and to exert yourself to keep the unity of the Spirit. That means that's purposeful, y'all. If you're going to endeavor to keep the unity, that means that you have to diligently do it. That means you always have to stand your guard in order to keep peace. Why? Because the adversary, who is the devil, who goes around seeking whom he may devour, is looking for every avenue he possibly can have to get in and cause strife and division. If he can separate the little antelopes from the pack, then he can devour them, right? He's looking for that schism in the body. He's looking for that place of division in the body. That's what the enemy is trying to do, is trying to tear the body apart. That's why it's important for us, in order for us to walk worthy of that salvation that we've been called to, we have to be diligent. We have to exert ourselves, not toward random things, but toward keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That word endeavoring in the Greek, I love that word. It means a lot to me for a lot of different reasons, but that word endeavoring means, um, the word is uh, the Greek word spudazo. It's fun to say, spudazo. Say it, spudazo. One of the things, a few years ago when we had um, our own coffee business, um, we ended up having to change the name of it because it turned out we were in copyright violation with a name that we did have, and so that was the name I chose. I chose the name spudazo because it means to diligently exert yourself. And I love that. I love that idea of diligently exerting yourself for unity, for the sake of unity. Because that's not about you getting your way, okay? We can all be unified as long as y'all all all agree with me, okay? If you all agree with me and you all do everything I say and you treat me just right, well, then we can all be in unity. But unfortunately, that's the way a lot of people think about unity, Okay, yeah, I can walk in unity as long as everybody, you know, pats, pats me and everybody treats me the way I want to be treated and everybody's nice to me and everybody, you know, nobody says boo to me and everybody's good to me, then, you know, I can walk in unity. Well, that's not, that's not unity. <laughs> that's not being diligent. That's not making haste and exerting yourself for the sake of others, right? And so when we're talking tonight about this, you know, if the, the work, the fivefold ministry gifts given to the body for the equipping of, that just simply means the enabling of, in addition to the other two things we talked about last week, it means being able to walk worthy of the calling of salvation that we've been called to. All right? So I didn't realize that this was all we were going to get to because I still have like a page and a half of notes just for tonight. So we'll just pick up with that next week. But, what, but the place that it's a good place for us to get to is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So go there. How do you get there? How do you get to the place where you are walking in lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, and you are forbearing with others, and you are endeavoring to keep that, 
unity, that bond of peace. How do you get there without getting in a ditch and letting people just run right on over you? Okay, because again, body of Christ is awful to, you know, hop from one ditch to the other, one ditch to the other, all right? So, you know, so this, this is the way. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, y'all might have guessed we might go there. One of the things that you do is you confess the word of God over you. There is so much, you know, we even started with this tonight, just sharing you know, casually about, you know, the power in the word that my children learned when they were here as children growing up. There is power in the word, and the word is alive. It's, it's a living thing. And so when you confess the word of God over you, you are releasing God's life into your life. And so if you are in a place to where those things that, you know, just you realize in just those three short verses in Ephesians chapter 4 that, you know what, I really I need to be able to walk worthy of this calling to which I've been called, but I need help in these areas. How do I get that help? Simple. It's very simple. You confess the word of God over yourself. Well, how many times do I have to do it? You have to do it until it starts to manifest in your life. And then once it starts to manifest that lowliness and meekness and long-suffering and forbearing and endeavoring, once those five things start to manifest in your life, you keep confessing the Word of God so that they don't go away and so that you don't get puffed up in pride over the fact that they're manifesting in your life, right? I mean, you keep confessing the Word of God over you. So it goes like this, all right? So we're going to read all of this chapter, but then we're going to confess part of this, all of us together. In, verse 13, um, in chapter 13, verse 1, Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Okay? Those three verses that we just were reading in Ephesians is all about the love of God, the agape love of God. Okay? It's all about love, unconditional love for others. And see, what Paul is saying, it doesn't matter how pretty I sound as a preacher. It doesn't matter how, how great and eloquent and wonderful I am as a preacher. If I don't have this kind of love, then I am nothing. All right? And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. I don't care how many miracles the person has in their ministry. I don't care. And Paul doesn't either. It doesn't matter if you have prophecy and you have miracles going on. If you do not have the love of God manifested in your life to the degree that all five of those characteristics are in operation and in full manifestation, then you are not walking worthy of your calling. I don't care what else is happening. I don't care if the dead's being raised up. If you're not walking in loneliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing, and endeavoring, then you are not walking worthy of your calling, and you have to answer to God for that. You're going to have to answer to God for that. God's not going to say, let me see, T, how many people did you raise up from the dead? No, he's going to judge you based on being worthy of the calling to which you were called. Did you walk in it with these things? All right? So, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. doesn't matter how many soup kitchens, clothing, pantries. It doesn't matter if you're martyred. None of that matters. If you are not walking in this kind of love that he's talking about, because people do a lot of stuff, and they do a lot of good stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all part of their call. Do you see that? Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And we're just going to stop right there. Now, the way that this works is you realize that that love, the love of God, is part of your spiritual DNA. It's part of your makeup. You were born again by love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You were born again by love and through love. That love is part of your spiritual makeup. It might always, not always be manifested on the outside. So this is what you do. And I'm going to say this and you say it after me. 
Instead of everywhere where it says love in here, you just say I or me, okay? I suffer long and am kind. I do not envy. I do not parade myself. I am not puffed up. I do not behave rudely. I do not seek my own. I am not provoked. I think no evil. I do not rejoice in iniquity. But I rejoice in the truth. I bear all things. I believe all things. I hope all things. I endure all things. I never fail. Now look, a lot of you, I can even, I even, I feel that kind of prickling in me too, you know? And you feel that because you know that there's some of those things that you just said that weren't really true. They weren't really true about you right now. But the good thing is we have this great thing called positional truth. And that positional truth means that because I've been seated together with Christ Jesus in heavenly places, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can say the word about myself, and it's true about my born-again spirit. And the more I say it, and the more I confess it, then what that is what is called renewing your mind with the word of God. Because by the spirit, which is the word, is spirit and it's life and it's power. So by the spirit of the word and by your spirit and by the Holy Spirit all working together, you can change the way you think. And when you change the way you think, then your actions change. And before you know it, all those things are true about you. They're manifested. Other people will say those things about you to your own shock. Right? To your own shock. Real quick, I'll tell you a story. We've got two minutes, and I'll tell you this story, and then we'll be dismissed. But 17 years ago, this December, my best friend died from cancer. And she was a beautiful person, and I was thinking about her when we started this service because the song that Anessa opened up with was a song that she sang to me often. She was a worship leader. She was an incredible, beautiful black woman, and she is the very first person who really ever accepted me as a real person and also honored the gift that was on the inside of me. And I treasure her always. And I found a lot of pictures of her over this last weekend as well. So I've been thinking about her a lot. But when she died on December the 18th of 1996, we went to her funeral. And there was a person who was going to be taking part of her funeral that not only did I have zero respect for, but I blamed considerably for her death. Um, and so I was, I was really in between because I needed to be there because she was my dear friend. And I was grief-stricken, I mean horribly grief-stricken beyond belief that she would be gone at the age of 31 with a six-month-old newborn at home. And I, you know, I, I was just so angry that I was going to have to go to the funeral and at the funeral, I was going to have to, to listen to this person that I felt had opened the door for this cancer to come into her life. I mean, it may or may not have been true, but that's what I believe. So it was true to me because that's the way I thought of it. Well, she was being buried in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where she was from. So we had to ride all the way up there, and a friend rode with us. And that friend, a Rama graduate, had the fourth sight to know that I was in a major dilemma and that I needed to be in a whole different place when I walked into that funeral than I was when I got in the car in Winterville, Georgia. And so all the way up there, it's like a five-hour drive, all the way up there, he did what we just did. He read this scripture out, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he made me repeat it. I mean, he didn't make me, but he wouldn't let me. He wouldn't let up. He wouldn't let up. You know, there'd be a little pause for a little while, and he'd start back, and he'd say, love suffers long and is patient and kind. And I'd say it, love suffers long and is patient and kind. I suffer long and am patient and kind. I suffer long and am patient and kind. And we, he did that for five hours, y'all, over and over and over again. We walked into that funeral. I, by the grace of God and the help of Holy Ghost, I endured that funeral and then went with the family afterwards. Um, I was um, her son's godmother. 
the only white person in the room. I was, you know, I was his godmother, and I was there um, with the family afterwards. And he came in, and instead of having that hatred, that anger, that resentment that I had felt several hours earlier, I looked at him, and the very first thought that came to my mind was, love suffers long and is patient and kind. And I realized that he needed that just like I do. Amen. And I'm not his judge. God is. And I, had, I realized right then that I had to quit blaming him for what had happened to Tanya and that I could not carry around that resentment. I could not do it. And I just broke right there, not necessarily because of the death of my friend, but because of something in me that died so that something else in me could live. Do you see what I'm saying? The scripture is powerful, and it'll change your life. And it's all about becoming that person that God has designed you to be, enabling you for the work of the ministry. Y'all stand up. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, for your word. Father, we honor your word. We honor your word tonight, Father. We thank you tonight, Father, for your word. We exalt your word, Father. We know that your word says that you even exalt your word above your name. And, Father, we just magnify you tonight. We thank you that in your word is life and power and truth. We thank you, Father, that in your word is deliverance and healing and any part of salvation that we have need of. We thank you, God, for your word tonight. And, Father, we thank you that as we leave this place, we, re we leave realizing that you are the one who has enabled us. You are the one who has equipped us for the work of the ministry. And, Lord, we thank you that you are continuing to show us how to walk out our part of the salvation that you have called us to. And we give you praise and we give you all the glory, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody say, y'all be blessed and we will see you Friday night at Oasis at 7, Sunday morning at 10.